You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande, and this is Let's Get Surety. I've got my co-hosts with me today, Mark McCallum, CEO of NESBP. Hey, Mark. Hi, Kat. I think this is going to be a crystal ball episode. <laughs> I can tell you were on episode one of this series. I was. It's nice to be back. So this is the second in a, a two-part series that we have, are so pleased to have Jack Callahan, CPA and partner at construction in construction industry leader at Cone Resnick joining us for. Thanks for joining us again, Jack. My pleasure. Thank you both. And if you listen to episode one, which if you haven't, I would recommend that you do, you'll know that we talked about the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program and spent some time just talking about the changes and updates and where it was when we recorded that episode on June 26, 2020. Today, we're going to be talking in this episode about what that really means for bonding companies. What are these changes and what does the PPP program mean for bonding companies? So Jack, what, do, what would it mean in a best case scenario? Well, thanks, Kat and Mark again, and thank you to your members for taking some time to listen to this. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the plans and how to go through these the PPP and file the applications and get the money and then now how to apply for and get the forgiveness. And, and document the, along the way, right? <laughs> document, 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 every step of the way. And what's happened is it's been terribly successful. Contractors are the third leading industry on taking down debt. Uh, and that, I know, is going to give a real kind of earthquake shudder through the surety marketplace. What do you mean? Contractors all took on a lot of debt. And they did. You know, we went through this incredible, you know, 10-year run of a strong market. And blessedly, most of our clients had gotten out of debt. They cleaned up their balance sheets. They had gotten the paid down, you know, most of the debt that they carried. And maybe they had some zero interest or low interest uh, equipment notes that were carried on the books. But now they've gone out and they've borrowed millions of dollars uh, across the industry. It's billions of dollars that have been borrowed by contractors. And so what is that going to mean to the financial statements? Um, with what we discussed last time with the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, we really are very optimistic and we really very much believe that most of this debt is going to be forgiven, um, that there's going to be um, the formulas are in place for most of this debt to be effectively converted into a grant and will be forgiven. But short term, you know, we do a lot of we have a lot of our clients, the sureties up here in the Northeast certainly like to see six month financial statements. And then all of our clients need to do their year-end financial statements. And at the six-month financial statements, this debt is going to be sitting on the books as a current liability. Uh, the Even if they're on the eight-week program, they will not – pretty clear now, the banks are still not accepting the forgiveness applications yet. So they will not have submitted those forgiveness applications, and they will not have gotten acceptance of that forgiveness application from the banks. So the amount of money that they borrowed will be sitting as a current liability. As accountants, we'll have to carry that as such. We'll footnote the fact that the company has filed an application or is expecting to file an application for forgiveness, and they expect to have the amount reduced. But uh, we will not, at least we as Cone Resnick, will not be able to reduce that amount off the balance sheet. We're very clear that accounting literature is precluding us from doing that. Um, then comes December 31st, which is let's, most of our clients, as you know, with the tax law changes, most of our clients are fiscal year end clients. At the end of the year, December 31st, again, if they've elected the 24 week period, there's a very strong likelihood that these debts will not still be off the balance sheet at that point in time. So you're going to be looking at clients that are going to be carrying these debt balances and it'll all be current debt. So it's going to, you know, throw out all of your current ratio formulas. And you, as an industry, you're going to have to make a decision, as the banks are going to have to make a decision on how they're going to treat these um, these debts on the books and if they're going to impact their formulas for you to extend surety credit. So it's something that we're all going to have to take a hard look at and, and be aware of. In addition to that, you know, we, we discussed a little bit in the last program, this ability to for all companies, even those under the PPP plan to be able to defer the 6.2% um, FICA tax, the employer matching portion of the FICA tax, and pay that out over two years in 2021 and 2022. So again, 
you know, where you're looking to your companies to always have paid their payroll taxes and to be current. You're now going to have this accumulation of a, you know, of an accrued expense. And because it's a, of the nature of it, it's going to be a current expense because of the nature of where those expenses were, were formulated from. There were current period payroll taxes. So you're going to have an additional uh, liability that's going to start to build up onto your balance sheets of the company. So, you know, you need to be working with your clients to understand how big their asks were, how much they borrowed under these plans, and then help them to work with you to go through the formulas. You know, please don't, uh, you know, the contract is as well as I do. They're going to not want to address this and they're going to hope that I'm going to be able to make it all go away for them by the end of the year. And we can't, you know, we've had some discussions with some prospects. Well, our guy's telling us we can, we can, if we know we're going to get the deduction, we can write it off. And, and we just, at least what the AICPA has dictated to us so far, which is our standard boards, you know, the, um, is saying, no, you've got to have to carry these liabilities until they've actually received forgiveness on them. Um, we also know that, you know, while they've gotten, once they get forgiveness and we'll be able to write those off, there's always going to be this threat and this exposure of an audit. The audit program is six years that's built into this. So again, it's going to potentially trail around for quite some time. And, you know, what I want the in, your surety to all understand is that, and again, this is, you know, those of you who are on the last call, I, I did go to the Atlantic City Boardwalk and I spent some time with, with Madame Marie, the fortune teller. <laughs> from Springsteen fame, and she is. She's told me that she sees a big shaming, public shaming of contractors. Uh, we've seen it already. Construction was was one of the largest lenders under this program. Uh, the president Trump and and Secretary Mnuchin came out and said that they would not make the list of companies that borrowed funds under this program public. The House has come back and challenged that, and they've instituted litigation. And it now seems very clear that uh, and FOIA um, requests have already been submitted for the lists of those companies that have gotten loans under these programs. And um, you know, we saw it on the first go round. It was only those pub those companies that were publicly traded that publicly disclosed the information. And you saw the shaming of Shake Shack and the Lakers and, you know, Harvard University and others. And, and they were, you know, it hit the papers and, and it, it really had some negative backlash and it substantially hurt, you know, the, the capital, uh, the, the market price of a company like Shake Shack. So they immediately turned around and gave the money back. Uh, well, most of our clients are privately owned and I don't see that kind of, of market share. I do see this public attempts at public shaming. And, you know, I've been out there talking to the industry trade associations and, and then I think, you know what, the contractors shouldn't have anything to be ashamed of that. They put their people at risk every day. The men and women who work for them went out there every day in the middle of this pandemic and they executed very complicated, very complex construction projects. They continued to work when most of the rest of the world locked themselves down in bunkers. And, you know, there was a cost to the those who contract is to put those people out in the field, both an emotional and a personal and a physical cost that went along, and uh, that they were hurt in the short term with all the PPE, the personal protection equipment that was required, all of the social distancing requirements, the education, the training, all of these costs that by and large will not be reimbursable under any of the contract provisions. So they had to absorb all of that additional cost. They had to you know, absorb all those additional um, challenges in their day-to-day -day business. And it was a program that they were entitled to, that hopefully they all followed the rules. They did the right thing. They've reported accurately and properly the information, and they were entitled to, to the full benefits under this program. But again, you know, from a surety standpoint, you never like to see your clients in the front page of the newspaper. And I have to tell you that I just, you know, human nature tells me, and Madame Marie confirms that, you know, some local newspaper is going to want to know why the contractor with that hundred million dollar contract, they think a hundred million dollar contract, of course, means you're worth a hundred million dollars. But, you know, you've got a hundred million dollar contract and you borrowed four million dollars under this program and, and therefore and you kept it away from some small mom and pop shop and, and therefore you're the big bad contractor. So, um with that's going to come that public scrutiny. I think again, as an industry, we can stand up to it, but they have to be prepared. And I think you, as a surety, have to be prepared to see some of your customers bandied about. 
and, and know that, you know what, trust in fact, and make sure you've talked to them and, and make sure that you are comfortable as we have with our clients, that they did follow the rules, that they are, you know, entitled to the money that they have and that they're going to be able to, uh, to support the challenges and to support the audits that are going to be coming on at a later point in time and prevail uh, for the forgiveness. And if so, then you should be looking at some pretty substantial um, earnings and some very strong profits being recognized as a result of this, the PPP loans and their ability to take advantage of it. Jack, it's uh, kind of interesting. And when you looked in your crystal ball, you said uh, shaming could be a component of that for the construction industry. You seem pretty confident about full loan forgiveness. So in your crystal ball, uh, you don't see any alternatives, politics getting in the way for uh, to impede on full loan forgiveness? I don't. I, again, I, you know, they keep clarifying with now up to 60 or 70 different questions and answers. And every day we get updates and every day we get clarification. And so if you follow the rules and regulations and, and these clarifications have made it really easy, much easier and it's much less subjective to follow, I don't see how anyone can, can fail the tests. Now, if they let's take the worst case, Mark, because it's always a good question. And I'm smart enough to know that I, I don't know what you know, somebody's going to do on this. If the worst case, there's some change later on and our clients have followed the rules, they've gone by the guidebooks as they've been set out, but somehow there's a change in course and they deem these to not be um, forgivable, you know, right. and your client has used them effectively and efficiently and they're left with a 1% five-year note on their balance sheet, you know, that's a pretty good cost of funds. It's pretty good. So, you know, worst case, failing all these forgiveness formulas, they were able to borrow, you know, uh, an amount of money that they were able to borrow into this plan and have to pay it back in five years at 1% interest. And they've used it effectively. You know, I've gotten, I've gone to my clients and say, can you get vendor? You know, you've got a lot of vendors that are struggling, you know, and without hurting anyone, you know, if you take some small discounts and, and, you know, to pay people on an accelerated basis, if you've been able to work with subcontractors and pay people on a timely basis, and get good pricing because you've been able to, to keep subcontractors working through this tough times and keeping them paid, you know, you should see some long-term advantages. So um, again, I think, you know, that's kind of, I always look at this. All right. Worst case, if it all fails and they do change the rule book, what did you do with the $5 million that you borrowed? And if you had to pay it back with zero or 1% interest, it, it, to me, it shouldn't have a negative impact on, on the clients other than, their perception of, of where they were with the deductibility. Right. So assuming everybody is confident, uh, the surety uh, credit provider, uh, the bank credit provider, um, then they'll know how to look at uh, those financial statements, right? Um, how much education do you think needs to happen, um, you know, in them looking through uh, the financial statements and, uh, deciding how to treat that before uh, debt forgiveness. I hate to say this, but the young people in, in the surety industry, those who've been in this industry for less than 10 years have never seen a downturn. So they've seen nothing but pretty solid, pretty consistent numbers. And so they're very used to putting, you guys know the drill, you put all your numbers into your formula and they create matrices and, and they create ratios and they kick out differentials. And also when the differentials hit, there's a red flag and a lot of explaining has to be done. So I think there is going to have to be some education and it's going to be some training that's going to have to go on. Um, I think, again, it, you really have to make sure that your clients are taking a hard look at their bank loan covenants. I think that every bank right now, as we sit here in June you know, of, of 2020, understands this pandemic. So if you've got loan covenants that you know when you've looked at this, you're going to blow your covenants at the end of the year, get to your banks today and get your waivers on those. You know, again, it's going to be hard pressed for anybody to sit here with you and say, oh, I, I, what are you talking about? You shouldn't, you know, you, you blew your covenants. You saw yesterday's paper. The banks are now being told to expect defaults and to be, you know, not be able to make any dividend distributions. And so they're looking at, at banking regulations to come in and impact the banks. So. You right. don't want the banks six months from now when they've been faced with all these federal regulations 
to go back and start to look at your loan covenants and give them a reason to put throw you into default and ask you to look use that free sort of PPP loan money to accelerate and pay down their loan provisions because they're getting skittish on the construction industry. So, you know, you've got to educate there. And then, you know, those clients who work in a federal agency or a state agency program where there's pre-qualifications, I don't think you're ever going to educate those folks on the change. You know, you've got state employees, as I call them, like tenured professors. The only way they're ever going to get in trouble is to make a decision. So if they can look at a formula and you now, you know, you're because of the debt, your debt to equity ratio drops you from a pre-qualification of, you know, of 100 million backlog down to 50 million in backlog. Uh, I, you know, good luck. And I, we will be there with our clients championing it and fighting it and arguing it and trying to discuss it. But I think that's going to be a real potential impact. So given everything we're sitting today and given, you know, Given the, the best, you know, fortune tellers out there in the business, you would love to see your client right now loaded up with backlog, loaded up with backlog. that's actually going to be being able to be worked on it. I and mean, we saw, right. uh, you know, recently the, the New York MTA putting a stop to work. We've seen other agencies slow down some of the big airport projects being put on to, you know, putting on, you know, delays. So I'm confident it's all going to come back. I, I really believe Everything I see, and I've, uh, we've lived through some bad times, and we've lived through some tough situations. These are temporary glitches, but it could take a little while. So you're going to want to make sure, again, that your clients are have got good sound backlog, that they've got backlog that's going to actually be, be able to perform upon. And because, again, these these we are going to have to educate the bankers. We're going to have to educate the surety, and we're going to take our best shot at educating state agencies, but I don't see that being very successful. So I do see that there's going to be some, potential pre-qualification impacts that are going to going to trickle on down through this this economy. So it sounds like that's a call to action now uh, where the the business and its advisors and the surety industry should be out there being proactive about educating uh, lenders and officials and others about the impacts. Um, you had mentioned the uh, backlog. Um you know, what about preservation of their uh, banking lines, uh, their liquidity, and dealing with uh, expenses and overhead? You know, I've, I've encouraged every one of my partners across our industry practices across the country here to meet with every one of their clients and, and get involved in it in, you know, what we call our SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And take a hard look at all of the different sections of their business. What happens? Which which lines of business are potentially um, going to be threatened here? You know, we've got a, a client, very large interior retrofit, high end, you know, corporate space contractor. And, you know, we're sitting to talking to them and saying, are you going to be out of business? You know, it's short term. You're going to do a lot of retrofitting and a lot of shields and a lot of, you know, protective uh, right. workspace. But long term, what's your future going to be? Uh, where if you're in the hospital business or you're in the broadband cable distribution to, to, to rural municipalities, you should have a strong run on it. But I'm encouraging every one of my partners to execute with their clients to get involved in these sit downs. And I, you know, would suggest strongly to all of your, your surety, to the agents out there, make sure the agents are part of those discussions. Talk to your clients. Have they had one of these brainstorming sessions? Bring in. I always say for a contractor to survive and thrive, he needs that core team of trusted advisors, which is his CPA, his banker, his attorney, his insurance agent, his surety agent, and that they're all in a room working together and talking through some of the issues and some of the challenges because they've got to get their arms on it. Um, you can't wait to find out that your work's dried up and then start to take a hard look at your overhead. You know, you've got to look and see what your projections are. Is your overhead in line? Um, have you used, I mean, look at what this has done to us all with technology. Do you have the right technology in place to work remotely? Do you need to make investments in technology, maybe instead of iron, um, in order to, to survive and thrive in this competitive business? You know, and then internally, are you going to be prepared for the audits? I, I, you know, we talked all about these PPP plans, and, and we should talk a little bit about the tax implications, but there's also a very strong fear I have right now on any kind of, um, you know, time and material contracts, any kind of time and material change orders 
the federal uh, the Department of Defense has already come out and said, if you've got a time and material reimbursable contract and you have PPP loan proceeds and you get forgiven for those, those costs are not going to be allowable for you to submit for reimbursement to the federal government. Yeah. Wow. And what does that mean for their FAR multiplier for the subsequent year? You know, the extent they've used those dollars to cover their, you know, home office overhead, will it substantially draw down what their FAR multiplier is? We have not heard this yet coming back from the private sector, but it's only a matter of time before the private sector starts looking at their contracts. So you guys have the contracts in your hands. Do you understand what your clients have provisions to give back any um, credits that they get by way of, you know, the easiest to compare it to is the vendor rebates. You know, if you hit certain production goals and all of a sudden you get a discount from your, you know, from your lumber supplier, from your fiber supplier, from your, you know, metal supplier, are you supposed to pass any of those on back through to your, to the customer? And so we have to look at the, the what the impacts are going to be on these PPP loans from some of those scenarios as well. So there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of potential risk. And, and I think everybody's got to get, again, I, I think it's imperative for the, surety market as you get your year-end financial statements go through the reviews but what has your client done and document what they're telling you they've done by way of putting their processes and procedures in place to keep an eye on their overhead and to keep an eye on what the long-term market trends are going to be because you know we could get this trillion dollar infrastructure plan you know and trillions of dollars of work could start to hit the street but sadly we've seen in construction more clients fail on an uptick market than fail on a on a down market, you know. It's just right. A, right. And so we we have to look at what that impact is. And again, before you start to feed the clients on doing all this work, you also have to understand whether or not they have the do they have the capability to shrink, but also do they have the capabilities and do they have the technical expertise to grow and expand to respond to the markets the seg- segments that may be out there. We we know it's not always the best when a contractor changes his stripes and starts to do work completely outside of his. We take that wonderfully successful interiors contractor and tomorrow he wants to build federal government buildings. Maybe he'll be very successful, but maybe not. We, we've seen certainly track record of how that has played back and forth. So do you see um, contractors who may be in, in one uh, construction sector uh, decide that, like, for instance, maybe they're just focused on private work and do you foresee them maybe switching over to public work and the dangers that might uh, entail uh, as they're trying to survive? I certainly do, Mark. You know, I've had four clients reach out recently about, you know, getting involved or meeting with my government contracting team. I have a, I'm blessed, you know, as I always say, in working in an organization like Cone Resnick, I've got a team that's dedicated to government contracting. They're headquartered down in our Bethesda and Tyson's office, so they're tied into the Beltway, and they work on the FAR issues, and they work on the DOD, and, you know, on a regular basis, they understand their provisions. So those are the smart ones. They picked up the phone and asked me, you know, we're thinking about getting into government contracting. Right. You always say, okay, where's your code of conduct? Where's your, who's your ethics compliance officer? Who's your, well, okay, right. Let's slow down and let's go through what you need to do to be an f- effective and responsible government contractor because it's a different game. And again, things like these, these addbacks from the PPP loans, the stuff that they wouldn't necessarily have thought about without playing in that space. But you know, it happens every time there's a glitch in the market. We see clients react and, and we've seen clients successfully go to new regions of the country, and we've seen clients miserably enter new market spaces, even going across going across the street and thinking, you know, oh, across the street, that can't be very different. But, you know, different labor local, different unions, different, you know, you know, whoever the, the inspectors for the projects, it's just a whole new game in town. And so got to be very careful in what they do because, yes, the contractor's nature is – to be a bit of a gunslinger and to go chase work where they can. And, you know, our role, collective roles as, as CPA advisors, as legal advisors, as surety advisors is to, to walk through the walk and make sure we hear them out and make sure that we're all comfortable that they've gone through the process and the checks and balances to go after that new work. And, you know, somebody's going to give them the bond. We, we hear that all the time. Somebody will give them those financial statements. And 
I've been blessed to be at a point in my life now where I can say, good, let him go get somebody else to issue those financial statements. I, I'm not going to. And hopefully a lot of your surety companies and your agents can, can take that same stand and say, you know what, we want you to survive. We want you to thrive. But, you know, we want you to take a long, hard look before you go into some space you've never played in before. Well, and um, it sounds like you've had some good clients who are very receptive uh, to the advice you're giving. Um, do, do you think in general uh, contractors realize uh, this moment in time and that they need to be more alert and thoughtful? Or do you think it's um, that they're really not focused on looking at the future and what they need to be doing? I didn't say mine were responsive. I said they were thoughtful. They picked up the phone. <laughs> 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 and then you get more the price it costs to go and what you need to do and the types of attorneys you have to gear up to. And then right. we will see if they're, if they're really, you know, if they're responsive enough and they're going to take it on. But no, <laughs> I mean, look, at, for almost 40 years in this business, I know the nature of the contractors. They, they don't think it's that hard. You know, they think they understate a lot of what's involved in a lot of these businesses. So their reactionary tone is let's, let's go get the work and you know, we'll build it. And so it, it, that's why I said we try. We, we make sure we're available as a resource. We try to make sure that they've surrounded themselves with good people that can tell them. But, you know, um, across the broad spectrum, I'd say no. Too, far too many, you know, trust in themselves and their abilities to have gone through things in the past. But, uh, you know, so that's our role and that's your role as the surety agent and surety company to just pause, make them pause a little bit and make them think about some of these tough decisions out there. and. And just make sure that we all collectively know the resources that are available to steer them in the right directions to get facts so they can make some better informed decisions. So, so where can they go to get some of those resources, Jack? You know, it's working with that team of trusted. It's knowing that attorney that works in, you know, we're going to my our mom and pop construction attorney dealing with claims with the local municipalities may have been fine. But if I'm going to work in government space, I need a an attorney that handled federal contract work. I need to make sure my accountants are up to speed that they right. can handle um, the requirements and the, and the intricacies of working in this new environment. And again, it's making sure that you've got an insurance agent that is able to respond and make sure that they understand the challenges and the insurance requirements that come along with working in these new spaces. And I guess, you know, from your surety standpoint, you should have that checklist. And, you know, when they come to you and say, we're looking to make this jump and say, okay, let's work through a team. Do you have, you know, an attorney, have you gotten legal advice? Have you gotten accounting advice? Have you gotten insurance advice? Have you gotten your banker on board with these changes that you're going to make? And, uh, you know, I still, you know, in the old days, we always meet, you know, we have these year end, um, you know, we'd have the year end banker meetings. We'd have the year end surety meetings and we'd all sit down around a table and we'd all sit for lunch. And with everybody being so busy, we have less and less of those. And I, I think, you know, as, as maybe it all has to be virtual now, but I, I, I want to go back to, to old school banking, old school accounting, old school, you know, surety work that, you know, I think those face to face meetings are pretty essential to have and to make sure to be able to look the guy gal in the eye and say, do you have the, the right support staff to get you through these times and, and to help you grow, or expand or, or reduce as you go? If uh, somebody wants to find out more information does cone resnick have a resource center where they can go and get additional information we do mark thanks and i'm sure kat can get that out to everybody we have our coronavirus resource page which will take you through all these implications on the ppp act and then um, through our website you can access our our government contracting team my partner partner Kristen souls heads up that group down in dc and then myself certainly and anybody can feel reach out to me and i can make sure that i can connect you with the right resources here internally. And I said, it's, and I'm not just, you know, love the fact that it's a pitch cone resnick, but there are good accountants out there. And so those clients that have good relationships, make sure that they, they go to their, get to their professionals that they work with and, and that they seek out the advice, but if they need help or they want some direction on this stuff, we're always available through you as an organization, through any of your, your members and certainly to any of the contractor members out there to provide the expertise. All right. Thank you. Thanks for talking through the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program with us and, and how it really is going to affect the not just contractors, but but bonding. Yeah, it, it, 
the world's changed. It's changed and it's going to continue to change. And, and you know, I, I remain long term very bullish. I think we're going to have tremendous uptick. I think, you know, if, if anything, we've identified that maybe the words infrastructure have changed. It, it may not all be highways and bridges. It's going to be broadband communication. It's going to be securities of our water systems. It's going to be securities of our some of our other integral parts. But this all has to be done through construction spending. Now, the question is, uh, for the first time ever, we saw in two months, eight years worth of federal spending, and nobody once asked how they were going to pay for it. Um, now we're back to the realities of how are we going to pay for it as we move forward to the next round of, of funding. But I'm pretty confident that um, construction is going to be, uh, you know, a way out, a way out of the, these difficulties and these challenges. And, and again, I think we've continued to identify some glaring needs. Uh, we've all realized how, how wonderful it is to drive those of us who have gotten out and driven around. How great it is when you have these uncongested highways and how productive, <laughs> <laughs> how productive all of our clients' workforce has been. You know, materials arrive on time. You can predict when they're <laughs> going to show up. You can predict when your manpower is going to show up on the job site. And so, you know, I think it just makes it clear. So, again, I'm, I'm bullish. I think long term we're going to be fine. But I think we all have to, to get our arms around the challenges because it's not going to come without – some more lost tears and some more anguish and some more you know, gnashing of teeth. And there are going to be some contractor failures and we have to be prepared to get through and get our clients to the point where they're the ones that are going to survive and thrive through this. Well, Jack, a lot of food for thought. Thanks for looking into your crystal ball and letting us know what you see, uh, not only on the Paycheck Protection Program, but uh, just the construction and surety world uh, in the coming months. Thank you. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP, and its members, visit nasbp.org.